In this video, I'm going to show you the 2.1 Excel skills, which are how to construct a frequency distribution, and then from there, how do we make a frequency histogram and a relative frequency histogram. So this data is the data that is in your 2.1 PowerPoint. If you go to Blackboard um, under Lessons and then the Chapter 2 folder, this is the same data in the 2.1 PowerPoint, so you'll be able to follow along here with the video and with the written instructions in your notes. So the PowerPoint tells you to make a frequency distribution with seven classes, and you will always be given the number of classes. So you don't have to guess it or figure it out. You're always going to be told how many classes to use. So the first thing we need to do is figure out our class width. To do this, we need to figure out the range of the data. So the range of the data is the maximum minus the minimum. And it's easiest if you sort your data. So I'm going to highlight everything and then in the upper right corner, sort it smallest to largest. So to find the range, I can easily say our max is 450 minus our minimum of 59. Then our class width is our range divided by the number of classes. And if you notice, every time I want Excel to do math, I start off with an equal sign. That equal sign is the kind of Excel code for, hey, do some math here. And then I'm using a lot of cell references because it makes the calculations really quickly. Once, once you hit the equal sign and you click on a cell, um, you can then do math with it without having to type in the number, which just speeds up the process. So our class width is our range divided by the number of classes. And then regardless of what your class width comes out to be, always round it up to the next whole number. So even if it came out to a whole number, I would still round it up to the next whole number. If you do not round it up a number, your classes are not going to contain all of your data, which is a problem. So always, always, always round your class width up to the next number. So our class width in this case is 56. So next we list out our lower class limits and our upper class limits. Our lower class limit is, the first one is always our minimum, which is 59. And then the class width tells us the difference from a lower class to the next lower class limit. So since the class width is the difference from LCL to LCL, we can take the previous one and add our class width to it to get the next one. And then if I go up and click on that formula and hover over to the bottom right hand corner, I get the plus sign. I can drag that down until I have the seven, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, I need one more, seven lower class limits that are going to be the starting point for each of my seven categories. Now our upper class limits are the numbers that the class should stop at so that we don't overlap the next class and we don't leave anything out. So our first class starts at 59, our second one starts at 115. So we don't want to overlap the 115 but we don't leave, want to leave anything out so let's have our first upper class limit be 114. That way we've got 59 to 114 and then 115 to something, and so all of the numbers will be in a class without having any gaps. So our upper class limit, the difference between each of them is also our class width. So if I take that first upper class limit and then add my class width to it, I'll get my second upper class limit, which is 170. So our second class goes from 115 to 170, and then the third one starts at 171, so that's nice. Again, we're not leaving anything out. And then I'm going to drag that down until I have all seven classes. So I always like to list out my classes separately. It helps with labeling in the graphs, which we'll get to pretty soon. But I always like to actually like to list it out. And again, this is a personal preference. You don't necessarily have to do this. Um, but it, I think it makes my graphs look better when I go to label them here in a little bit. All right, so we have all of our classes. Now one thing that some people like to label with is the midpoint. And the midpoint is just the middle value of each class. And the way we do that is we average our lower and our upper class limits. So we take our lower limit plus our upper limit and divide it by two. And I had to use parentheses to get order of operations correct. So if we average the class limits, that tells you the midpoint. That is the middle number of that first class. And if we drag down that formula, since we use cell references, it gives us the midpoint of each of our classes. Uh, I don't typically label my graphs with midpoints, but if you like labeling with midpoints, that's awesome. You can do it and it's correct. I prefer to label it with classes, but again, that's personal preference. You could label with classes or with midpoints. Okay. So now that we have our classes, we need to sort our data into the categories by finding the frequencies. 
So the frequency just tells you how many points are in each class. So our first one is 59 to 114. So if we highlight the numbers that are between 59 and 114, down at the bottom it tells you the count. So it tells me that I have five data points between 59 and 114. And I'm just going to shade those in a gray color just to help keep it straight so I don't oh, double count anything. So the next one's 115 to 170. So let's see, we have eight there. Just a slightly different color. So we've got eight in that one. Then 171 to 226, we have six. We've got six on that one. Then 227 to 282, we have five. Then 283 to 338, we have two. Let's see, 339 to 394, we have one. And then 395 to 450, we have three. So this is our frequencies. It tells us how many data points fall into each category. If we sum our frequencies, if we add them all up, I'm using the sum function, we should have the same number of points as our total data sets. We have 30 points in our data set, summing the frequencies, they summed to 30, so that means we have all 30 points accounted for. That's good. You want to make sure that you have all of your data sorted into a class and you're not leaving anything out. So the next thing that we might be interested in is our relative frequency. And the relative frequency tells us the percentage of the data that falls into each class. And the easiest way to do this is to take our frequency and divide it by the total. And this will tell you the proportion of the whole that each class takes up. So dragging that down, we see, let me make my decimals a little bit more uniform. In this class, we typically always round to four decimals, so I'm going to set it to four. So we see we have about 16% of the data in our first class. We have about 27% in our second class, 20% in the third class, and so on. So this just tells us the percent of the data that falls into each of the classes. And if we sum our relative frequencies, we should get one to represent 100%, which we do. So we have 100% of the data accounted for. Uh, one other thing that sometimes is interesting is a cumulative frequency, which tells you how many data points you have found down to that point in the chart. So for our first row, we only have five data points. That's our frequency. So the cumulative total, which is the number of data points down to that point, is just five. But when we move down a row, we now have eight more. So if I add the eight to the five that I already have, our cumulative frequency is 13. If we go down another row, we'll add six, so we'll get up to 19 and just keep on going down. And I've set up that formula, so when I drag it down, I don't have to retype anything, which is nice. And at the bottom of the cumulative frequency column, we should have 30, which is the number of data points we have, which again is correct because that means everything's accounted for. All right, so this is our frequency distribution. It has our classes and it has the data sorted into the classes and we can see our frequencies, our relative frequencies, and our cumulative frequencies. Charts are awesome, but pictures are better. So now what we want to do is turn this chart into histograms or pictures that shows us what we are looking at here. So in Excel, and I probably should have said this earlier, but in Excel there's a dozen different ways to do anything and I'm showing you my favorite ways in these videos. But if you can do this math a different way, that's awesome. I actually never see your Excel on test. So as long as you're getting to the same answer doing something in Excel, it is fine by me if you do it a slightly different way. And if you think you know an awesome technique that I don't know about, please show it to me. I learn stuff from my students every semester. So if, if you think you've got a better way to do it, you know, please, I'm all ears. And that way it will always be growing and improving moving forward. All right, so to make our histogram, our frequency histogram, start off by highlighting just your frequencies. Then go up to Insert, go over to Column Chart, and pick that very, very first 2D column. Now, a histogram has, must have the bars touching. The easiest way that I know of this 
is when you're clicked on your chart, it should have you in the design tab. If it doesn't, go click on design and then go to quick layout and change it to layout eight. If you'll notice that instantly makes your bars touch, which is good, and it gives you places to put titles and labels. So let's see, what was this data representing? Let me just take a peek back at our notes. So this is the price of 30 GPS systems. So this is the price, then the frequency, and then this is cost of a GPS. So we've labeled our axes, and it's showing us how many GPSs fell into each of the classes. Now the one bad thing is that our bars are labeled one, two, three, four, and so on. They're not actually labeled with our classes. So the easiest way I know of to finish correctly labeling the graph is to right click on one of those numbers, then go up to select data, and then we have an option for our horizontal axis labels. We want to edit that and then just go and highlight whatever you want to label them with. This is where I like to label it with my classes. If you want to label it with midpoints because it's less cluttered, that's fine as well. You can see that it's actually kind of cluttered. If I make my graph a little bit bigger, it looks better. But this shows you that we have five GPSs between $59 and $114, eight GPSs between $115 to $170, and so on. If you want, if you right click on a bar and put add data labels, It'll actually tell you the height of each bar, which is kind of nice because sometimes the bars all the way over on the right. It's hard to figure out exactly where they match up on the left scale. But this is our frequency histogram. Again, everything is well labeled, everything's titled, and it shows us a picture so we can easily see which classes were the most popular. We see most GPSs are in the low to mid 100s. There's a couple that are really expensive, but most of them are low to mid 100s. If we want to make a relative frequency histogram, it's a very, very, very similar process. Actually, it's exactly the same. So let me drag this one out of the way. So if we want to make a relative frequency, we start by highlighting this time our relative frequencies. Then we insert a column chart and again, change that layout to layout eight. I'm going to label this. Let's see, this is our price. This time it's our relative frequency and it's still showing us our cost of the GPS. I need to right click on one of those numbers, go to select data, edit my horizontal axis, and again, I like to label it with classes, but you could also do it with midpoints, it doesn't matter. And then right click, add data labels, just so we can see the exact height of those bars. And that's our relative frequency. So we do it exactly the same. The only difference is do we highlight frequencies or relative frequencies in the beginning. And what you can notice, let me bring both of my charts back up. Let's make them about the same size. These graphs are exactly the same, and they should be. It's showing the exact same data. It's just a different viewpoint. One showing the count and one showing the percentage. And it just depends on the problem as to which one you prefer. Um, sometimes you want to know the numbers in each category. Sometimes you want to know the percentage of each category. And again, that's just a personal preference.